That was really interesting from Hannah Lynn. I think what's kind of interesting about this event um, is that uh, we're slightly at the beginning of getting GovDesign right and understanding what it is. There's something about do we do user experience? Was that everyone's role? So what I'm going to talk about um, is a hypothesis about organization design. We're still at the, quite, at the beginning of understanding what that thing is. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time about just a few hypotheses about what I think organization design is, why it's important, why it matters, kind of what next and stuff like that, just all the really small things. Um, firstly, uh, I work for an organization called FutureGov. Um, we celebrated our ninth birthday with a curry the other day. Started very small and began by talking to local authorities about why Twitter uh, exists and why it's not going to kill your organization and make everything go and burn to hell. Um, eight years later, councils are sort of warming to that notion. Um, but we've worked around the world and had the privilege of working in over 100 local authorities, but we've worked with national government as well. Um, and coming up, I've got a little uh, chat about transport, so weaving it all together, hopefully. Um, so that's who we are, and we work across a whole range of services. Our local government deals with a lot of stuff, um, big things like adult social care, people getting old, uh, children's social care, like taking your child away, transport and infrastructure, collecting your tax, and obviously collecting your bins, lest we forget. So we work for those kind of people, and this is what an organization is. So not too worried about really tight definitions, just a group of people um, with a particular purpose at any scale. So organization design is difficult to place. We've struggled at FutureGov. Um, we've had an organization design team. But to try and relate it to product and service design, quite simply, it's the organization design is the design of organizations. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Adam. That's really clear. <laughs> Perfect. End of speech. Um, so what's the problem? Basically, what we find when we design a lot um, are big sort of face palms um, in what we're trying to execute because we'll work with a range of different people and organizations and come up with really, really good design, um, really good experiences. We have a development team who build really good products. Sometimes they land, sometimes they don't. Often they don't. And so as we've evolved as an organization, and I think as our understanding of service design evolves within the sector, within the private sector first, but now within the public sector, we've thought a bit more deliberately about why this is happening. There's a guy called Bud Goodell who founded Novel, who I'd recommend. If you're interested in organization design, they're a really good place to start. Um, and they're trying to deal with that specific problem of why you have brilliant processes, brilliant people, but unfortunately you can't land your brilliant design. So we have a total design approach at FutureGov. We have service designers, we have product designers, and we have organization designers broadly. And yes, it's T-shaped a little bit. Yes, we also throw it out. Yes, it means lots of things to lots of people. Yes, it's a bloody Venn diagram. I'm sorry. But it does help us sort of place product, service, and organization design a little bit. Maybe in two years' time, we'll call it something else. Strategic design is probably a more common uh, articulation of that. But I'm focusing on organization design because we are redesigning organizations specifically from our point of view at FutureGov. With common methods. So we found it difficult to place how we do things as organization designers. But we can follow a very similar process. The Dumble Diamond, which if you're just starting out studying, you're growing, going to grow to love, and I've grown to hate a little bit, but <laughs> then grown to love again. And it's the same process for organization design. Very conceptual so far. Hopefully you're enjoying that. So let's go through a practical example. Transport. So I'm going to use Uber. 
because I like to use cliches. I don't know how many presentations you've been, but Uber tends to turn up. It's often in the news. Um, I thought it'd be helpful to use them again. Um, but they are interesting because uh, at the beginning, when they were trying to understand user need, they tried to redesign the taxi services as they were, concluded that that was too difficult. So they set up a company and an organization to build a service outside the current taxi market, the current market for going from A to B. This is obviously much harder in public organizations where we deliver services which are essential. And someone asked a question about the difference between private and public sector. That's one fundamental difference. We deliver services that people rely on for the public good. And we often deal with monopolies. We can't break them off. Or can we? So a harder example than Uber is rural transport. And this is a project I worked on in Essex and Suffolk councils. Uh, these are the two larger county councils in the east of England. Um, they have a combined population of over 2 million, uh, combined budgets of over 2 billion, um, and uh, have a big challenge. Transport can sometimes be seen as the veins of a society in, in many ways, and it becomes a really important issue in rural areas if you can't get about. If you can't drive, suddenly transport becomes super important. It's super important anyway, but if the distances are large, it becomes even more so. And the problem is, in rural areas, is that it's declining. Investment in buses has gone down 40% in the last six years, and this is being felt by people we often don't hear about. I had a bit of a reality check yesterday. I did a lunchtime session in uh, Harlow, a small town, with practitioners. Um, and I asked, how many people have heard of service design? And there are 25 in the room. And these are practitioners who do this every day. The answer was zero. How many people have heard of the government digital service? You've all used the bloody service. Have you heard of the organization behind it? Also zero. And sometimes it, it becomes quite a stark reality about how much of a bubble I tend to be in, which is a bubble I usually enjoy. But it helps. <laughs> so I'm here, RCA and everything. But it's important, it's important for us when we're understanding about how people get about to really understand what their actual experiences are like today. And people will build their entire week and month and year around a bus timetable. So, ah, not technical issues. It causes huge amounts of pain. I met someone who hadn't left their house in six years until they had discovered demand response of transport. Loneliness is a huge issue. If you can't get out of your house and can't drive, you can't travel. If you are a young person, it is very, very common to decide what college you'll go to, or what education you'll have, or what job you'll do, depending on whether there's a bus route or not. So life choices are determined by transport choices. And the council spend a lot of money on subsidizing transport. A lot of this is home to school transport. There's an obligation for councils to uh, move young children uh, of school age over a certain mileage. But ultimately, a huge amount of money is spent, which is kind of weird. Because if you stand on a street corner of any small town, there's a lot of public transport going past, but you can't access it. So this is what we thought. So we had loads of hypotheses about how we solve this problem. We thought about car sharing, but realized that in England, people don't like to share the car. In France, that's fine. But people genuinely in this country, culturally, don't like to share cars. So that was obviously going to be a design constraint. Uh, we thought that maybe we could scale Uber somehow. So it could be about taxis in rural areas. The business model doesn't work. That's why they're not there. We tried to think about how we might incentivize bus companies to... Uh, uh, advertise their routes and put GPS and real-time data. But they have very little incentive of doing that and having open data because they're running all their own apps. So we had to think slightly more outside the box, slightly more creatively. The issue with rural transport is that there isn't any rural transport. It's not a digital issue. It's a fundamental issue. <laughs> it took us six months to realize this. <laughs> to be honest, 
That's kind of funny, but with, they handed out loads of cash to local government, and everyone came back saying, we're going to build a massive portal, which br brings... We're basically going to build TFL. Uh, but the issue is people don't need real-time tracking data of buses that don't exist. They want buses. They want to get around. Um, so what we've done is try to articulate the unmet need and the unmet supply. So I'd like to travel somewhere by not going to tell anyone because who I can shout about it, but it won't make any difference. And I'm a supplier, and I'm already taking this individual, which is very common, to a school, to a care home, or non-emergency transport to a hospital appointment. But again, at the moment, I have no incentive of having lots of other people on that bus, and it's often minibuses. So it's very common to stand on the street corner and watch lots of public transport go past. So we're trying to rethink what public transport is, because at the moment, having private companies, a cartel of about six in this country, expanding their network is not going to work. So what we want to do, and the hypothesis is, that we have a better bus with superpowers, whereby you can design a bus route and you can pick a spot where it'll pick you up and pick a spot where it'll drop you off within a zone. Boston are doing something similar. We've nicked a few ideas. It's always the best way. And we're going to, it's a hypothesis that people might sign up on both sides, which we're going to hopefully start testing soon. The service design is that demand responsive transport and potential new users can be combined on the platform. The product design is that we do that with tech. Older people might want to phone in. They might do it agnostically from tech. But for many people, technology is a way they will expect to be using transport. For organization design, it's a huge challenge because this challenges the role of a council or an institution in what they do when suddenly they are not subsidizing bus companies. They're creating a platform where they have no say about what routes are going to be created because they're going to be created in real time by someone who requests it or in real time by a provider who provides it and posts it online. If you've worked at GDS, you've seen one of these. If you haven't, you've probably been to a presentation where there's one of these. If you haven't, then you haven't been to enough presentations. This is a, these are why this is a service experience map. There are many ways of talking about this, but I want to talk about the organization design components. There are lots of service and product design challenges, but the organization design challenges are around what the council role is now. So our staff have different roles. Traditionally, I would procure routes. Councils will work with providers to decide exactly where a route goes, what time the bus leaves, how much per passenger they will subsidize, and more often not where to cut bus routes. It's bonkers, but this is what they do. They have planners who will plan routes. Not based on very good data either. They have spreadsheets and Bob, because he's worked there 25 years, knows where the best route is. <laughs> I've spoken to Bob, and he's got lots of knowledge. But Essex is a big place. And Bob probably doesn't know everything there is to know about where people would like to travel. Bob's also going to retire very soon. <laughs> Policies and incentives are wrong. I'm incentivized to be Bob, to be the person who's all-knowing, not to collect good data, and not to actually allow users and providers to match up. I'm incentivized to support large bus companies because that's all that's existed for the last few decades. What's magical in a way about TfL is that they have a relationship with the private sector where they control all of the rules. And many people think this is the answer in rural areas. But it's much harder for a council rather than a huge metropolitan uh, city like London to control these very large companies. They are bigger than councils. I'll tell you to fuck off, basically. Which is hard. So you have to go around them. Legislation is blocking us. There's loads of legislation around who can go in and go out of a bus and why. Some of it makes sense. Some of it doesn't. So we need, re we need to redesign some of that. The government digital service has re gone back uh, and rewritten legislation when they've realized it doesn't work for users. Procurement, finance, how do we do that now? If I'm now no longer, if I'm just subsidizing per route, 
that changes the model quite substantially. I'm not subsidizing a bus, I'm subsidizing an individual. And over time, maybe I'm not subsidizing anyone at all. But I'm still spending 72 million pounds, maybe very differently. And what are the command and control governance arrangements of all of this, and who controls the data? So they're organization design components, hypothetically, and I'm nicking this from Dan Hill. The components, and we've tried to draw some red lines about where you might talk about organization design up here, potentially. I'm not going to read them out. Just stand silently. If you're doing good for time, it's good because I'm being finished. Simply put, the habits, situations, and events that decisions are produced within. This is really, really important. It's really, really important if you're going into a career in any kind of design, but really, really important in government design that you understand how decisions are made. They are made by people who haven't heard of service design. They're made by people who feel threatened by agile ways of working. They are people who are threatened by someone with a brown glasses and their top button done up to their neck. These are realities that make decisions happen and don't. They're incentivized by their own CV. They're incentivized by their boss's CV. They're incentivized by legislation they've been told under many governments, particularly New Labour, that they have to adhere to. They're incentivized by history. Maybe without knowing it, they're incentivized by where they live. These are really important if we're going to get our brilliant designs through government. And it's really important for government design. And in a way, it's the beginning of a conversation. But there are lots of opportunities. We talked about how you might have product design, service design, and how it all links and everything. I think specialism is really important, but I also think awareness of the entire design environment is really important too. And it's really interesting. You get to have very frustrating meetings with um, sometimes very bald, overweight men um, trying to explain why you might need an additional bit of budget because, yes, you haven't immediately saved £20 million, but, yes, lots of people quite like the service, uh, and, yes, it only costs £10,000 so far which is really fun. So these habits, situations, events are changing rapidly and they're becoming more important than ever. Organization design is a peanut butter to the jelly of design as a whole. It goes together. It's delicious or disgusting, depending on who you are. But it's hopefully something we can start talking about as being part of the conversation. Historically, and I'll finish off with uh, Arup, who um, was, uh, who set up the uh, now construction and engineering firm, Arup, who coined the term total design at the beginning. And, and what he did and realized is that when you're designing complex infrastructure projects, you traditionally would have set a brief ask an architect to come up with it, an engineer to build it. But by bringing those disciplines together, you're able to build more wonderful, more flexible, more desirable buildings, like the Sydney Opera House, most famously, perhaps. And hopefully, potentially, we're at that moment, because we're still at the beginning of understanding what the mechanics and the architect architecture and the engineering of government is. Because we can't see it as well as a building. It takes longer for us to understand because organization design is even more ethereal, even more intangible, even more like the black, mat black matter that makes up 83% of our universe, it's much harder to put a name badge and say I'm an organization designer or sign up to be that person to do that work. But it's really important, I think, and hopefully you think that too. A couple of challenges, but you can ask your own questions. And that's it. Thank you.